Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have all IT types, the ISTP, INTP, INTJ, and ISTJ. I've had some friends have difficulty telling apart these four types because they can sometimes seem a little similar on the surface. This panel is to help figure out some possible differentiations. And so Mara, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Hi, I'm Mara. Um, I'm a blogger at Practical Typing, and I'm an ISTP. Cool stuff. And Spacey? I'm Spacey. Uh, I have a YouTube channel where I occasionally upload videos about typology. Uh, I offer typing sessions, uh, and I'm an INTP. Awesome. And Michael? Yep. Uh, Michael, I also have a channel on here, but there's not much, not much happening there right now. I've been pretty pretty much off the internet for a little while now um going back to one of my pre-lockdown commitments so um other than that i don't know it's been cold and dreary here for a couple of weeks so i just feel kind of damp but happy to be here happy to have you and mark hey i'm uh, mark a uh, civil engineer from brisbane australia great stuff and my name's Joyce, and I'm a certified MBTI practitioner, and I facilitate the instrument and organizations. We have all the introvert and thinking types on this panel. And on the surface, these types can actually look kind of similar sometimes. So we're here to parse out the differences and get to know the cognition behind these types a little more. While superficially, they might have a little bit of a similar demeanor, their cognitive reasoning, their cognitive process is wildly different. And so in this panel, we'll be looking at the ways in which they process information and make judgments and discernments and see where we get at. The first question of the night is, what is your relationship with emotions? We're thinkers, we don't have one. When things happen that trigger an emotional response, uh, I guess, I can either swing the way of just, uh, either way I'm disconnected from it, but then that can result in either not expressing it whatsoever, or it can result in me kind of going out of proportion and maybe reacting with like way more anger than it uh, necessitates or something like that, but not really realizing it at the time. Um, usually whatever happens, um, it's not until later on that evening or maybe the next day as I've been thinking and processing it that I kind of work through how I feel about whatever happened and how maybe I should respond to it. So usually, I guess if I'm dealing with it in a healthy way, uh, I have to, you know, basically not react when something happens and then think about it for a little while and then come back to people. With some FE inferiors, I've had them tell me that there's a little bit of an emotional delay. They won't actually know the extent to their anger until like a little after or until it actually erupts. It takes a while for it to kind of show sometimes. And Michael and Mark? Yeah, I mean, I'd say I'm, I, I don't experience that delay. I'm pretty in tune with, uh, whatever my emotional state is. I don't experience huge emotional swings. Um, and generally, I mean, I, I just I also, I, I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten sort of less um, reactive. I'd say when I was younger, I, I could be more uh, to, to sort of, how do I put it? To, um, to be able to control a situation, I would I would use emotion as a tool sometimes, and just just sort of you know be able to lash it out, uh, which wasn't sort of an authentic kind of expressiveness, but it was more of just some something that I could use for for this or that purpose. So that's you know less and less as I as I get older, I think. And um, I, but at the same time, there's there's um, what what I might have said as a younger version of myself was that I, I felt very emotionally chilly a lot of the time. And I think, um, you know, 
a lot of that had to do with just general discomfort about like any, with warmth, you know? So I've gotten more comfortable with, with warmth, but I still, I don't, I, I don't find, you know, passionate emotional swings, um, uh, in, in my experience still. Yeah. Are you saying Michael, that your emotions are more even keel? Even keel. Yeah. It would be, um, Yes. Cool. I think yeah, that sounds, sounds right. <laughs> How about the rest of the thinkers? Do you have even keel emotions or is it a different experience? Yeah, generally pretty even keel. Um, but I'd say like when I do get worked up or whatever, it's a bit like a volcano sort of a thing. So it can be quite externally look quite placid or quite usual, but um, it can be like it's almost painful sometimes the emotions sort of internally um if i get to that sort of phase yeah mm -hmm. um yeah. the big one for me is like i always struggle to identify what it is like to put a descriptor to what i'm feeling it takes me a little while to sort of process that i just know that i'm feeling a certain way quite strongly yeah i think my emotions generally are actually pretty unstable but um in terms of expressiveness of them, it's, I guess I look pretty even keel on the outside. Yeah, I get the emotional delays. I relate a lot to what Spacey said. I'm really bad at expressing my emotions. I get the delays, but if I do know what I'm feeling, I can go zero to 100 really fast and scare everyone in the room. Interesting. I would add, I could maybe, maybe clarify a little bit. I, I can, I feel like I can get stuck in a mood more than I can get stuck in sort of an emotion. Cause I think of emotions as sort of swinging and being more changeable. And as far as a mood goes, I mean, I really need to start the day the right way and sort of not just jump into a day and just, you know, just sort of get a sense of like where the compass is pointing for that day and to be able to, to, settle into the day before I just launch into it. Cause otherwise I'll just get dragged down into some mood or another and it's hard to recalibrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like generally thinkers, they have a more even keel expression on their face for the most part, unless they're having one of those emotional swings, <laughs> then that might be a different case. What I've been hearing from all of you is that there is sometimes a volcano mode, like you'll go from not feeling anything to just bursts of intense emotion. And so it's almost like maybe thinkers are a little more prone to compartmentalizing their feelings until it reaches a certain tipping point and then it just overflows uh, at that point. And so that's pretty interesting there. And it seems like the FI tertiaries are a little more in touch with their own emotions and with the FE inferiors, the ISTP and the INTP, there a little bit of an emotional delay there. And so those seem to be a little bit of the themes there. And so the next question I have for everyone is, how have you all dealt with the social game, people? Um, for me, it's mostly been a process of trial and error, I guess. Like. Uh, when I was younger, I would do a lot of like kind of poking and prodding at people and like, let's see how they respond to this or let's see how they respond to that. And basically kind of cataloging people's reactions and seeing what gets positive reactions and what gets negative reactions, et cetera. Until eventually I'm able to kind of put together a, a blueprint for how to, you know, effectively interact with people at least on a basic level. And I think for a while, I kind of rode on a really basic, like, hello, how are you? I'm a robot kind of kind of level. Um, but uh, I guess over time, I learned to get a little bit more granular with that in terms of interacting with specific people or specific types of people. And maybe even, uh, I guess, as I grab on my any more or whatever, just having fun interacting with people and just kind of seeing what I can get out of them. Yeah, more, yeah, trying to get more enjoyment out of it rather than seeing how I can just get by, so. I mean, I would say not at all for me until I was about 30, probably. And since then, I've, 
I be, I become more of a social butterfly, but I guess that's only relative to what I had been in the past. I don't think anyone else would describe me that way, but um but until I was I was extremely withdrawn until yeah, until until around 30 and now I mean I'm on the phone every day and I keep a pretty large group of friends now. Not too many close friends, but um a lot of people that I check in with. So, but not until later uh, in life up to this point. Um, definitely agree with Stacey about the trial and error. I think that's probably been a big part of it. But also touching on what Michael was saying to do with the withdrawn, like definitely that's something that resonates with me as well. Um, I think a big part of the social game for me is always like just trying to find things in common with people. So like fishing for something that we have, you know, sort of similar and trying to build off of that is always somewhere where I try and start off with. That's a good strategy. And Mara? Um, I mean, I'm fairly withdrawn. I usually try to just kind of get a feel for people and figure out what is okay and is not okay. Because <laughs> I kind of, I'm fairly sarcastic, but I kind of hold that back and wait for the, the person usually. Like, I was playing online with someone at Call of Duty the other day. He had a friend that I didn't know. And the moment he basically made a crack about something I said, I was completely comfortable at that point and picking on him for the rest of the evening. It was kind of a back and forth thing. That's wonderful. So it seems like the trend here is that there's a very introverted style of approaching the social game. It seems like the word withdrawn is coming up over and over again, which is like stereotypically introverted, but there is some truth to it. As you see, like introverts tend to answer that way. Now I'm wondering like, what is the strategy if you want to become friends with these four types? Do we have to proactively kind of talk to you because you're kind of like, like Spacey said, are you like waiting for someone to kind of initiate but, first? Yeah, someone has to initiate and then I'll be perfectly friendly. Like I'll probably go from like stone faced, like drifting off in my head somewhere and it may kind of be like off putting to most people. But then if you break the barrier and start talking to me, then all of a sudden it's like my, you know, FE switches on or something and I'm just like, hey, oh yeah, well, whatever. Like, it's not like I'm even afraid to interact at that point, but I'm just kind of waiting for someone else to, like, signify that they want to interact. Makes sense. Yeah. The other person has to be a little bit more proactive with pursuing one of these four types, I guess. I do occasionally initiate interactions, but I don't always. But I, don't, I also have a tendency to withdraw before I think I have a chance to get rejected. So, mm. That's good and cautious. Like you put yourself in scenarios where you're not likely to be rejected. So it's less likely for it to happen. Good on you. And so my next question for everyone is, how do you react when you have a crush? Do you try to ignore those feelings or just try to subtly gain information on that person? Or do you try to not pursue at all and hope it goes away? How do you experience crushes? What does subtly gain information on the person mean? <laughs> Whatever you want it to mean, Michael. Searching their social media. God forbid. Um, it. I mean, it doesn't happen incredibly often, where, to be honest. Um... It's kind of, I mean, if you, this is gonna, this is gonna sound worse than I, I, I wanted to, but it feels like just kind of a burden when that, when that comes up. <laughs> Maybe that's just the five coming out of me. I don't know. It feels like I'm, I don't, I don't want my, I don't want. I'm, I'm paying attention to this, to, to these things now. And oh, here's this other, here's this other thing. It's another thing to manage. So I know that probably sounds a little, <laughs> a little chilly, but, um, that's yeah. I can relate to that. I mean, yeah, pretty much just try to ignore it and wait for it to go away. I don't really try to get any more information or try to really do anything about it. So yeah, if serendipity uh, happens, then that's great. Right. You know? but yeah. But, yeah. But otherwise, I don't know. A trend with this panel is emotions are a burden. It seems like, like when that's said, you all are like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It depends. 
I have in the past uh, found ways to interact with the person if that's manageable. I'm not going to necessarily go out of my way. Mm-hmm. How about you, Mark? Possibly more of an Yeah, essay. agree. Probably, probably not going out of the way too much or anything. Um, might check the socials a little bit, not to really change myself or to sort of um, portray myself in a certain way, but more to see if I still like them after sort of having a flick through that stuff. Um, but yeah, generally it's just business as usual, as the guy sort of said. This is such a passive a approach to tackling your crushes. <laughs> I mean, has anyone has anyone here jumped from relationship to relationship throughout their lives? Because I I certainly haven't. Yeah. Or felt the or, or really felt the desire to. I mean, it's a real it's a commitment. <laughs> mm. I mean, I guess more recently I've kind of done that. Uh, but over the course of your life space. Yeah, it hasn't really been a pattern. I mean, I, I guess what I would say is if I have a crush on somebody, I kind of know that it's not really uh, good relationship material. Because like anyone Why? who I end up with is not somebody who I like I had a crush on and then initiated the relationship with them. It didn't go like that. So mm -hmm. it's usually you find like crush? A, from a distant Joyce? thing. What do we what mean by crush? What's a, what's a crush? A crush is when you look at someone and you're attracted to them. Immediately? Or it could be over time too. It's yeah, there's just like be butterflies. Sort of... Butterflies in your stomach for that person. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like, you know, from what Spacey was describing and what Michael was describing earlier, that there's a distrust of emotions. That's why you're like, okay, a mood is okay, but emotions, it seems like Spacey was like, you don't, I don't trust crushes because I've always been wrong about these immediate emotions that I've felt. So I'm not sure if I'm explaining this entirely properly, but <laughs> what, what I've been hearing, <laughs> what, how it processed through my mind was that there's a distrust of like an immediate emotional reaction. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, I've, I've considered going into a monastery. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like these are, yeah. Cupid's arrow isn't just flying all around my, <laughs> you know? Cool beans. And so my next question for everyone is, is there a fairly distinct internal mental shift between personal life and work life? Yeah, definitely. Like, I guess, however, yeah, work is literally like a separate universe where whatever shit I'm going through or whatever I'm feeling or whatever problems I have or whatever, it just, are gone and I just have to be a completely kind of normal person and I have to have like consistent social interactions with people, you know, I, I can't be my normal self <laughs> when I'm in a work situation. I have to be way more attentive to my surroundings and I have to be like way more uh, basically upbeat and interactive in order to maintain work relationships and, uh, you know, work, uh, perform at a certain level, I guess. How about everyone else? Mara? So like, what does that mean exactly? Do I become a different person at work? Good question. So I guess to define it a little further, is it easy for you to separate your personal feelings from work or your, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Thinkers in general have an easier time separating personal feelings and work life, whereas feelers on a general whole have a little bit of a harder time sometimes with separating personal feelings and work life. Like sometimes feelers ha are accidentally blend those two. And it seems to hold true with this panel because, you know, all of the thinking types here, it seems that you all nodded when you said that you had an easy time separating personal feelings and work life. So it seems to hold up. <laughs> yeah, I, I interpreted the question at first as like a work-life balance kind of thing, like mentally switching between the two. If it's about feelings, then I like to be, I mean, I, I feel I feel comfortable if I'm just being myself generally. 
you know? So, I mean, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm talking, I'm on a different like register or anything when I'm, when I'm at work, but, um, but I also d- don't tend to take things too personally if, if, if that's what you mean. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I don't think it has to be feelings necessarily, but I definitely immediately uh, recognize that I am in like basically a totally different mental mode once I arrive at work, basically. It's like I'm awake all of a sudden when I've been <laughs> sleeping. That is fascinating. Yeah. Perhaps your job also requires that as well because if you make a mistake you might die so when you have your life on the line then you're going to pay attention (laughs) yeah definitely (laughs) absolutely and so my next question for you all is what does the more playful side of you look like when work is all done i just crack a lot of jokes mostly it's humor jokes banter Yeah. yeah Goofiness. I'll be silly. Yeah, if one of the people the <clears throat> Pretty dry, sort of sharp sense of humor. Pretty quick wit. Generally, yeah. How it is. How does your playful side look like, Mara? I'm really bad at these types of questions. Um, I don't really know. <laughs> Interesting. No worries. Okay. The next question on the chopping block is how do or would you feel if someone calls you a robot, sociopath, or et cetera, or even just generally attacks your identity without really knowing what goes on internally? I don't really care. I mean, if that happens, I probably understand why it's happening. So I don't really feel very strongly about it. Like I might inwardly be like, they don't know what they're talking about, or I might be like, fair enough. Um, yeah, I don't really know what else to say. I'd wonder if, um, it, it would bother me if I felt like I was mis- misunderstood, I think, honestly. And, um, but I would also want a read on the person like who's telling it, it depends who's who's saying this to me who's coming who's calling me a sociopath like to my face <laughs> you know what i mean so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of context i think that i'd have to i'd have to sort through i would probably just find it funny yeah. and not really care <laughs> how about you mark yeah it doesn't really worry me i can sort of as, a, as the panel was sort of saying, you can sort of say where it's coming from, um, that sort of robot sociopath sort of stuff. But um, as we were discussing sort of previously, the emotion side of things, like what people see on the outside isn't always the same as what's on the inside. So yeah, it doesn't worry me at all, to be fair. <laughs> wow. Y'all are very resilient in a situation like that. <laughs> Well, I guess it's like Michael said, it, you know, it depends on kind of whether or not it's somebody who should know better or not, like if they actually know us or not. And most of the time I know that I don't really put out enough information or enough of my real personality for people to see that, you know, they're obviously going to misunderstand me because I'm not helping them understand very much. So, you know, I'll take my licks for that. Yeah. Something I've gained out of this panel is that like all four of these types are extremely private unless called upon to draw certain pieces of knowledge. So my next question for everyone is how does stress manifest in daily life for you? I've got a pretty high tolerance to stress, but when I am stressed, it's sort of definitely a lot more short and sharp. Um, yeah, it's probably I'm not, I'm not as flexible with things. It sort of needs to be done and needs to be done yesterday and it needs to be done exactly this way. Um, yeah. I 
I guess, uh, I don't know, depending on whether I'm repeatedly in stressful situations or not, it'll kind of slowly build and build and build and build. And I just slowly kind of start uh, like de deteriorating mentally and emotionally to the point where I'm kind of snapping at people occasionally or, you know, getting a little bit more unstable or reactive or whatever. And it, it just kind of eventually it kind of fills up and then, you know, I'll bleed some out and get like really angry or something. And then I'll go back to being pretty level and the whole time i guess i'll be feeling really anxious i'll feel it in my body and my mind and stuff but it just kind of bleeds out without me really thinking about it in usually uh unwanted ways but you know it takes a while for me to realize that holy crap i've been really stressed out yeah we were talking earlier about keeping things on an even even keel and i I sort of I value that, so I don't like being thrown off of that because I'm I'm stressing out or worried that something's not going to get something's not going to get done right. Or there's too much. Ha a lot of the, a lot of the times, just there's too much happening and there's too much noise in front of me, like just too much stuff. I like to have a clean like at at work. I, I like to have an empty inbox and have everything sorted out. And those are the kinds of things that I stress out about when I don't know everything that's in front of me that needs to be done and when it needs to be done. And it's just like, suddenly there's things popping up all over the place. And I feel like I have to hold too much in my head that it's not, um, um, that it's not just organized in my mind. So I'll, if it gets bad enough, then I'll just want to just distract myself and, and do something else and pretend that it doesn't exist. And, to, and eventually, uh, you know, there are those times when just things do pile up just because there's so much happening. And at those times, then I, I, I you know, if, if I get to a certain point, I feel like I have to wait it out. And then there's a day or two where suddenly I can just steamroll through everything. And it's back, not not that it's all done, but it, that it's all, you know, sorted out and it's all in front of me. And I don't, it, it's not just, um, uh, all jumbled up in my mind. So sometimes it's, it's, um, it, it's just waiting it out, but I do beat myself up over it when that does happen, which is not often, but because I just, I just, I, I really do value that sort of even keeled, like, I know it's in front of me. I know it has to get done, even if it's a lot and I've got it, I've got it covered. So the opposite feeling isn't something that I'm, it's, it's unpleasant for me. It probably depends on the source of the stress. I tend to either, if I can deal with it now, I'll deal with it now. Other times I'll completely avoid it for a while until I have to deal with it and I'll deal with it now. Um, I'm, I, I'm as a whole not a very stressed out person because I just go, I'm just not thinking about this at all until I absolutely have to. And I just kind of naturally line things up one at a time and only think about one thing at a time so that all the things can't stress me out. Yeah, that's fascinating. Mara mentioned something that's very auxiliary SE. So auxiliary SE is kind of takes things day by day. It's in the present, right? So it's, so it's going to deal with things as they come. A lot of people with SE in the dominant or in the auxiliary slot they'll kind of deal with stress as it comes to them. Like they won't try to like overly try to control the stress, but they'll try to go like, when it comes, it comes. Cause if you're just thinking about it, there's nothing you can really do about it right now. So you focus on the right now. If there's a really stressful thing coming up, like I know exactly when it's going to happen, there kind of becomes this, this, this black hole in my future in which I can make no plans beyond that point because on a mental level, the world's ending on this day. So I cannot plan beyond that day. I still try not to think about it, but it's in the back of my brain still there. That sounds absolutely terrifying. <laughs> so there seems to be this slight procrastinating element. Sometimes like there's a the stereotype of the P being a little more procrastinating. And I know it's just a stereotype, but there is like, a tiny grain of truth there as well. With someone who has SE in the auxiliary spot, sometimes there will be this present orientation to dealing with problems. It's kind of like a, 
do with what you can in the present. And so what that can cause as an after effect or as a byproduct is a, a slight procrastination because you're not necessarily thinking about it fully until the situation has actually arrived. And Mark's answer was super TE. When Mark said that he was stressed, he talked about wanting to get things done, getting things done yesterday, like, and getting things done in a specific way. So that's where the SI shows up. You know, SI has this very specific, particular way it likes things to be done. And the TE is the thing that's pushing it to want to be done. And so I don't know. <laughs> that was that was very ISTJ, Mark. <laughs> and so the next question I have for everyone is, what is life like when there is a lack of motivation? I mean, that's just life. <laughs> that's really depressing, Spacey. That's, yeah, that's like every minute of every day, pretty much. Yeah. Is that depression speaking? I don't know if it actually is. Because I'm not necessarily depressed. I'm just not motivated. It's just because there's nothing really that motivates me that much, I think. Yeah, there's kind of like a profound lack of motivation that would be depression, right? That's like this sort of just endless like, like don't even get out of bed kind of lack of yeah life. like that really kind of thing but then i i just also think of i aside from being in that state i'm familiar with that that's horrible and life is just long when <laughs> when that's going on but just in a normal just day to day then levels of motivation are just going it's up it's down i'm hungry so i'm motivated to give food I, I don't want to do this piece of work because it doesn't mean anything to me so it's it's a drag but then i got to see if i'm going to see a friend who i'm looking forward to catching up with you know what i mean so like that's just sort of um it's it's going up but in terms of like what i would actually identify as a lack of motivation that I would identify that as just a, a profound ongoing sense of just unmotivated to do anything. And that's just a state of depression, I think. That's awful. Mm. Mark and Mara? I'm a fairly motivated person. So I guess a lack of motivation is kind of boring. I'm usually trying to find something to, to focus on and dump my energy into. Mm. Mark? Yeah, can't really relate. Um, I've always sort of got some form of motivation, personally, professionally. There's always a goal or something I'm working towards. I'm not sure if that's that T-E-F-I, but, yeah, I've always got, yeah, something I'm trying to work towards, so, yeah. Interesting, yeah. So... I guess I have to clarify, maybe, like, I... In order for me to be motivated, there, I basically need some kind of responsibility. Like, I'm motivated by the fact that I need to pay rent at the end of the month. Like, that kind of thing. Like, I've got stuff that needs to be taken care of, so I better do it. <laughs> like. mm. Cool stuff. Yeah. I wonder if it's, it's not really type-related. I guess... Subjects in general are not ex exceptionally type related. It's how you reason your way through it that is type related. So yeah, it seems like the motivation question is just in an individual answer. <laughs> cool. And so my next question for everyone is, how was life like as a student prior to college? I feel like it was a waste. I wish I honestly just... Uh, not a waste. I mean, as a, okay. So student life itself, I feel like, um, the, um, I sort of got, I, I was pushed from school to school. I was sort of, I was taken out of my school in fifth grade and put into a different school because of behavior issues. And then, um, rejoined that group of people in high school. And then that's just a blur because I was just sort of, extremely withdrawn at, in those years. And in terms of like actually learning like student, student life, um, anything that I, any sort of education I've had happened after that in my twenties and thirties, I just sort of, I, I, I just looked at it as like playing the game 
of school, you know, and really didn't have, didn't learn much useful. It was just sort of playing a game. So it, yeah, not, um, I wish, I mean, if I had, to, if I had it to do over again, I would, I would do it differently because I had a lot of, I had to catch up for a lot of lost, uh, opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I guess intellectually I was understimulated. It was mostly boring, but even, even when I really should have been working harder, I guess to get good grades, I was still mostly daydreaming and not really interested in what I had to do in school. And obviously the whole social aspect of public school was just terrible. Uh, I mean, every, every morning I basically had to get dragged out of bed by my mother so that she could throw me back in that hell pit that I was forced to spend all day being in. Um, I would, yeah, I probably should have just dropped out of high school as soon as possible and yeah, done something more important with my life. Yeah. I, I agree with Spacey hundred <laughs> percent on the same page here. <laughs> How about Mara and Mark? I mean, I'm not really sure what you're going for. I just, I did what I needed to do and graduated when I was supposed to. Yeah, I don't really know what I'm going for either. No worries. Yeah, I agree with that. I just sort of um, did pretty well at school. Didn't have any study or work ethic, just purely relied on memory. And yeah, just did pretty well. And just, yeah, it's pretty uneventful, really. Yeah, nice to know. All right. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, perhaps we can all draw distinctions so similarities or differences between all four of these types. And perhaps the first distinction we can go through is TI in the dominant slot versus TE in the auxiliary slot. How would these types manifest differently because of their thinking function? I know the TE users tend to come out more structured, they tend to speak more definitely. The TI users typically don't, and we're not usually a structure, but this is all kind of relative to who you hang around with. Uh, I don't know. I guess the, the TE users seem to have a little bit more of like a causal understanding of things. Like, yeah, well, this is just a natural result of that. Uh, so this is how it happens kind of, kind of deal. Whereas I guess, I guess the TI dominance have, maybe that kind of an understanding somewhere in our minds, but it's not like at the forefront really informing our moment, our thinking in the moment. And it's not really how we express ourselves or describe things. I mean, I've found that TI users tend to be really good with that sort of random access kind of thing. And Definitely, for me, yeah. I, I, I need, I need a, um, I, I need to know what 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 frame am I in here? Like, what am I what 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 am I um, where am I addressing this from? Because it doesn't like get do, like something. It, I think I've tried to explain this on another video, and it never it never comes out right. But it's like it's almost like I'm I'm in a certain. Um, who brought it up on the on the last video that I did with uh, Spacey here? Because it was like folders that there are, there are different things are in different folders. And if I'm in one folder, I have a hard time. Like I have, to, I have to go and open up another one and figure out, you know, and, and sort of it, everything is very contextual in that way. So it's very situational. TI is just sort of TI is just sort of, this is how I understand, like, this is my understanding of, of, of how this works. And it's just, it's there, you know, for me, it's like, okay, well, how does, how does this work based on what, based on what, you know, there's always some, there's always something else that I need to, so there's, there's more of a, uh, there's more dissonance there, more of a delay, I think. I feel like. Yeah, I guess I have talked about that a lot. It, it does, I guess, seem like on a broader level that the TEFI is more contextual, whereas TIFE is more cross contextual or, or devoid of context. Yeah. That's fascinating. Does 
TE operate within the logical context of getting something done. So it's almost like situating your logic in terms of the logical cause and effect to achieve something. Whereas TI just kind of collects. <laughs> Or TI yeah, discerns more, like it's more like picking apart logic, but not in regards of an end goal. TI is like logic without an end goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a purpose element there, like a, like a why that is required when it comes to TE maybe. Yeah. As an example, I haven't thought about type in a while because I just haven't had like a, a reason to. So I'm sitting here, I'm looking through like my my like word clouds that I put together for functions right now because I'm like, okay, wait a minute, this is just not. I mean, I knew we were doing this, but as soon as we got to the the function questions, I'm like, I just haven't thought about this for for a while. I don't even know if I agree with myself on some of these things. Let me check this against against my okay. notes. But is that T E or is that N I? Because I can't always just pull information out of my my head just like that. It doesn't really work that way for me. Yeah, it's interesting. So it's but also the so change. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. But would the answer would the answer change depending on like where you dragged your yourself to? You know what I mean? I feel like with the, with the TI DOMs, it's like, well, that's the answer. They believe that. For me, it's like I believe that because we're doing this, or we're you know. Yeah, it seems like the the way that we're using the word random access can mean different things in, in different ways. So here, let me illustrate. So you could see it as a difference between TE and TI, whereas TE kind of needs an end goal or a, a reason to be kind of thinking down a certain logic trail, right? So in, in a way, because TI is able to operate outside of that realm, it seems a little bit random access to TE. Another way you could see it is NE is more random access because NE can just pull out ideas from anywhere. Extroverted intuition has an ease at randomly accessing ideas that are associated to the idea you're talking about, like what reminds them of that specific idea. It's able to make that loose connection, whereas it can seem way more random accessy than NI, introverted intuition in the INTJ and in the ISTP. So you could be using those words differently in different contexts. <laughs> For me, I feel like it's at, it's you, cause now I'm just playing back just this, this conversation and I'm like, you, you, you ask the question and I feel like I'm, I should be like, I feel like who's watching this video? Right. And what's my what's my role here? Because like I we should be there, there are people who are just coming in who have it who are new to this and everything. And we should be we should be teaching them. So like I, I don't I my I don't my head my mind doesn't go to like what's my understanding of this. It's like, okay, we're having this conversation right now so that somebody can watch this and get what out of it. And then I'm I'm trying to speak to that. And then I get um uh, a little tongue-tied because it's not me speaking my understanding of this thing. It's like there's all of this, there's all this other, other, th there's that frame around it, you know, which is why I usually prepare notes, but now I'm trying not to, not to do that because it seems, it's, it's, um, it seems fake. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's very TE, Michael. When I'll have coaching sessions with TJs, but especially like TE DOMs, what I notice them doing is they'll try to structure the session, but it's almost like they have a, that type of Michael mentality. So it's like trying to figure out how to help the viewer in the situation understand where we're at right now, or it's a, it's a logistical TE thing. I don't know how to explain it. It's almost like what Spacey was talking about, about the cause and effect, like TE is kind of looking for that cause and effect and how other people like what they kind of impartially need to get on the same page or to kind of like assist their knowledge, or I don't know how to explain it, but I just, when I'm with like a TJ user, they're, they're always trying to structure it more. So they're, they're kind of like, how can I structure the action steps? How can I structure the direction this is going in? 
And it's almost like Michael feels a little bit unsettled when <laughs> the, when he's not sure how to like kind of do that. Well, I can here I can I can clarify on this. So before we started recording this, I said probably five. You said you had you had questions prepared. I said probably five or six times. Post the questions in the chat. So I'm looking at the questions. This is the first question you've asked that's not on that list. And I'm like, I don't I don't know. I have nothing on this. You know what I mean? But like, yeah, I like to I like to be able to I like to have that thread to draw, you know. Mm, yeah. It was a lot easier originally how like you gave us question me questions on my very first panel, which actually the first couple of panels I did, which made it a lot easier for me because I have a hard time verbalizing my thoughts. So I needed to think about in advance. So, so that's why sometimes you're asking some of these questions and I'm going, I don't know how to answer this question. And if maybe I had, you know, my however long beforehand to think about or go ask Ryan what the answer is. I could have given you something. Because <laughs> half the time he knows me better than I know myself. So, hey, how am I like when I'm playful? <laughs> but like on a general structure standpoint, I'm not as a whole a very structured person. And usually too much structure is completely counterproductive for me. Yeah. That's something you mentioned before, Mara, about ISTPs, about how that third slot and I will kind of make it hard for them to verbalize their thoughts sometimes for some ISTPs. I mean, what I, it's definitely really easy for me to come up with some kind of an answer, but then- you're nine TP. Right, <laughs> maybe in retrospect, like after other people start answering, it's like, then I'll realize that maybe like, okay, this isn't the kind of answer that people were looking for maybe, or maybe I need to give a different kind of answer. So, I don't know. I will say that in general, it seems like TE people on like a way meta level have this need to have their thoughts structured, period. Um, that I certainly don't have. For me, it's just a constant cloud of chaos and out of that just comes some kind of order suddenly. That's a better way to put what I was trying to say earlier. Yes, I need the structure for there to be any thought. <laughs> you know, it's almost like the structure comes first. Like if it doesn't, you know, I mean, if you're saying you have like this cloud of chaos and you pull, see, that's when when when, when the structure is not there. I feel that cloud of chaos, but I'm just like, there's just nothing. It's just, it's just chaos. And I know Joyce can, can relate to just like, then sometimes they just got nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And sometimes you 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 do the you do the thing where it's like let me try to be spacey and let me just let me just put something out there and then we could just roll. But then you put something out there and then you just sort of chase it for a couple of minutes and then you're just like you know what I got no that's not working out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is so funny. I'm understanding how language can sometimes complicate things. Because I've heard both TE described as structuring your thoughts, and I've also heard TIs organizing your thoughts. And that can get really confusing when that terminology gets mixed up together. So let me try to explain. It does seem like TE needs to structure everything, including its how it's going to go about doing something. So in, in a sense, that's structuring your thoughts for sure. And But I've also had like TI described as organizing your thoughts, but maybe not in the conventional sense of the, the way. So, you know, on Mara's website, how she'll describe TI is like comparing thoughts to other thoughts. So the TI user is kind of comparing thoughts inside their own mind to other thoughts inside their own mind to another thought and trying to check for the internal congruence, how they measure up against each other. So in a sense, that's also kind of like organizing your thoughts, but it's almost like you're you're trying to organize your thoughts against each other for the TI. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> I, I, I am so sorry, Mara, if I'm butchering you. You can always correct me. I <laughs> it's kind of like this, you know, Spacey will sometimes, when he hears something that doesn't make sense, he'll go like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Like during a panel I, I do with him or a live Q&A, when something just goes through that mental TI filter and it just doesn't go through like there's something about it that just doesn't go through like TI is very likely to go like jump in and go like huh huh <laughs> I don't know it kind of sounds like that how I see it 
maybe you could say that we filter our thoughts. If you want to try to come up with a word for it, I mean, to me, I don't know how it is for an ISTP or whatever, but to me, it doesn't feel like there's anything organized about it. Um, it, it all happens moment and instantaneously based on whatever is happening right now. I mean, and, and it, it can draw from the past and whatever happens to be in there as a result of what I've been through in the past or whatever, but it's not, it doesn't feel like there's any process of checking things. Uh, I mean, it probably is just, a, it just happens. It just gets checked. Yeah. Regardless. And I, I wonder if that's a general thing or if that's a, also a function of your perceiving functions. Cause they, you know, and -E -E, there's a lot of -E. be like, yeah. yeah. NE might just not really value organizing it. Whereas my, maybe NI has a component of narrowing down. NI has a component of trying to filter down to the main idea or the main essence. So from that, sometimes it will be a little more organized. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can, for the most part, ag agree with that. Like, I don't feel like my mind is very organized. I feel it's fairly chaotic. I feel like I have this big jumbled mess so someone asked me a question now i'm searching the jumbled mess for this answer that i know is there somewhere and i might find it and i might not find it and it just kind of depends so you know when i'm given my advance notice i can find it before <laughs> beforehand because i know it's in there somewhere i know a lot uh -huh. of the information i take in is all has contextual filters on it doesn't necessarily mean i'm fully conscious of these filters but but the difference is, and we've seen this on, on all of the ISTP videos, is like you won't you won't make a fool of yourself like trying to just chase after something and until no, it's like if you don't have it's like, Mara, do you have an answer for that? No, I I don't know. <laughs> well, the problem is literally if there's a question I don't have the answer for, it's all blank. It's like I have absolutely no words for you right now, so sorry, I can't give you anything. No, so I got nothing. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. With the ISTP, it's like either blank or you actually have the answer. Whereas I think the INTP is a little more quick on their feet. They might actually like come up with a question. They might come up with Yeah, yeah. I was at a um, wedding reception the other week for my brother. And they had this open mic time for, you know, different people go up and say nice things about the you know, bride and groom, whatever. And um, of course, my parents got up there and said their thing. Um, Ryan got up there, said his thing, and then he looked at me like, are you going to say anything? I've got nothing. <laughs> and then, yeah, that didn't happen. But yeah, when you've got nothing, you, you won't try to like put something there just as a placeholder. Whereas I find like with INTPs, sometimes if you ask them something, they might actually try to like come up with an answer as they go. They're like, uh, more like NE might be more willing to kind of think it out loud and, and try to like, yeah, he's capable of thinking it out loud. Yeah. If I like don't have an answer, I mean, yeah, I'll just start by giving an answer and then hopefully my thoughts will catch up and I'll be able to like refine it and be like, okay, I'm okay. I'm okay. That's not really what I meant. It, you know, like try to, you can catch up to it and eventually come up with something that actually is relevant or accurate or something. But I'm not necessarily going to have the answer or really an acceptable answer either. Well, I even see like Ryan's able to kind of just, just pull stuff out and say yeah. things and think it out loud. Right. I am completely incapable of doing that. If I'm actually thinking about something, I am not speaking at all. Yeah, in that sense, any is kind of a talking function, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very verbose. It's very wordy sometimes. Azura Sex put it like this. With NE, it can load up to 5% and still speak, even at 5%, whereas like NI tries to load up to 100% before speaking. And so you'll that's where the difference comes with the ISTP and the INTP there sometimes. And, you know, Mara and Spacey describe their TI as a jumbled mess. And I wonder if you ever get bad reactions from TE users because of that. I mean, there are bit, the reason I, don't, not, I don't with TI DOMs typically. I mean, I think we're, I, sometimes T, that TI is in the second slot that I can get in those brainstorming sessions can get a little, but at the same time, I have nothing to contribute in brainstorming sessions. 
I prepare, I need to prepare generally. I think extroverted intuition generally, especially has that sort of improvisatory gift. And mm -hmm. I, I prepare um, and I, I like, yeah, I like advanced notice. And even with something, again, with something like this, like I feel like this conversation you know, I, I would I would be answering this 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 question specifically a lot differently, like outside of the context of this recording, because I feel like we owe it to the people watching to have like a coherent answer. But I'm just like I haven't I haven't had time to prepare for this. You know, <laughs> maybe that's an answer in itself. Yeah. You know, I'll say maybe I don't I don't try to. I usually I don't let that jumbled mess escape. I guess especially maybe in like a workplace scenario so i would say maybe the extent of a bad reaction i get from a te user is basically just them thinking i sound like an idiot because I, either i haven't really thought through whatever i'm saying completely or i don't really have a coherent understanding of it yet and i'm just like spitballing and that's kind of it they're just like what are you talking about <laughs> Well, this is what I've found useful about knowing type, though. You know, this is what I, I mean, outside of outside of having these conversations, like this, this is what I use it for. It has nothing, it has little, like I, I've, I've always been pretty self-aware. I mean, it's, it's been down and up, but, you know, um, in general, like, yes, I understand where someone else is coming from. Like you might, you might have gotten that reaction out of me before, like I knew what was, what was going on. Um, with different types of people and styles of interaction and styles of just, yeah, cognition. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Really cool. The, the <laughs> reason I won't share what's going on until I've managed to completely form a verbal thought is because I will get looks like you are a complete idiot. And so I just have uh, to kind of keep, keep all that. Is there, there are times where if I'm pushed enough, I will maybe share a thought and then usually there's instant regret because it'll come out sounding just because of when I'm trying to figure something out, the thought I come out with is not always going to be the smartest thought that I could produce. I relate to that <laughs> because TI is a bit of a jumbled mess. Sometimes when I guess we're communicating that TI to you, we're not explaining the most important TE point. It's almost like TE's looking for a bullet list, the, a bullet list of like the most salient points. It's kind of like, give me the executive summary of your points. I don't know. That's how I feel when I talk to TE. And so sometimes when my TI comes out, it's not always the most like concise, like executive summary or bullet points. How about, Mark, do you have any thoughts on this whole topic or whatever you'd like to comment on? Yeah, for mine, um, yeah, totally agree. I definitely do enjoy having structure. Um, that's a big one for me, but um, I sort of went into these panels hoping not to sort of see questions and things like that, and that was purely from a development of that extrovert, extroverted intuition a little bit, a um, bit of a challenge, a bit of a growth for me. Um, so that's how I sort of wanted to go about these sort of things, um, and that's why I've never really asked you, Joyce, for, you know, pre-warning or an agenda or questions or whatever else, um, to sort of, yeah, wanted to sort of try and stretch myself a little bit and just wing it as best as I could. Um, but yeah, certainly I totally understand where Michael's coming from with the structure side of things and picked up on that pretty quickly about um, his unease with the lack of questions sort of prior to kicking this off. Um, that was pretty abundantly clear in my mind that yeah, that was sort of, he's a bit concerned about all that. Um, yeah, TI, TI for mine is a lot more verbal diarrhea. Like they, sometimes they just, it feels like they need to say something to fill the silence a little bit. Um, so I totally agree. TE is a lot more succinct, concise, to the point, what's the executive summary and move on. So, yeah, that's sort of what I, th I think and feel about it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in your mind, you've already structured how you're going to, you're going to present the information. And so it's going to be more executive summary-ish. <laughs> yeah, and... I've actually had an INTP Power Red Bull suggest I hold an INTJ panel, but instead I give all the INTJs a list of questions, but then I just don't ask any of those questions during the panel. 
and then see their reaction. <laughs> I don't know if that would be a personal help for you, Michael, though. No, I just call it, I said, this, call it, I mean, you would start and I would assume that there was, a, you know, that you'd left that off the list. But if we got to question three or four, then the, <laughs> the conversation would turn into why did you give us a bunch of like, what kind of experiment is this? What are you trying to accomplish here? Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about what the next question is. We're, we've run through the ones that are on the <laughs> list in front it's fascinating. of Fascinating. Leading off of what you were saying, Michael, you know, TE is always asking, what are you trying to accomplish with this, with their TE? And on the other side of that polarity with their FI, sometimes they're trying to figure out your motivation. So why are you doing this? And so I've noticed with some ITJs, they can sometimes question why you're doing something with an INTJ I know, his sister was giving him Skittles and he was thinking, why are you giving me Skittles? What are you trying to achieve from this? And I was like, this is a very specifically like TEFI type of question asking with some of them, with some of them. It's almost like you're trying to figure out, well, well, why are you asking me this question? Or like, what are, does that make sense? If you like, because we were talking about earlier, TE always structures what it does or what it says right and by that logic then for other people you might like tjs might sometimes project that process onto other people you, you know you might go on you might be going like okay what is this person trying to achieve with how they're structuring this you know whereas like if it were just me maybe i'm not trying to achieve anything <laughs> i'm just <laughs> i don't know so um i don't know if i'm explaining this well i'm trying to like eh trying to NE, <laughs> it's not, not going well. Do you get what I'm trying to say though? So if I may try to interpret, I guess what she's saying is it seems like there's some kind of assumption built in that everything people do is for some kind of a reason. It's not that there has to be some grand design, just that there is some reason for it. Yeah. I can certainly relate to that, that questioning of motivation. I always sort of Internally, I'm sort of always, always asking why, why, why did you ask that? You know, where are they trying to go with that point? So I can certainly relate to that, Joyce. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'll definitely ask, is there a reason? I mean, at the very least, like, is there a reason behind this? Yeah. So I have noticed a trend that the tertiary FI users will tend to do people will create relationships or do people favors for the sake of later calling in a favor if you get more functional relationships going on and that's possibly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's Ryan has kind of, of described that basically I'm, he talks about basically where he's gaining, you know, potential favors, even though he knows he will never call them in. Yeah. I've seen that from TJs in general, even, even with that buy and fourth slot or whatever, maybe especially with the buy and fourth slot. Now that I think about it. But so I think you get the suspicion because they're going, well, if I am doing this to potentially get something back, are they doing this? Right. They assume exactly. that everyone is looking at the same game board where life is like game theory, where you have a bunch of little people who are little rational actor pieces on the board, and they're all making these rational decisions for some benefit to themselves and, you know, engaging in mutual trade or whatever in order to gain something from each other. I, I don't know where I'm going. I used to be more like this. Yeah, I, I used to be more like this with the, where there's this kind of like utilitarian calculus going on all the time, but it's, um, I that doesn't so much describe me now, but I think it's just because I, I realized it's not the, just the best way to to be, you know? I, I feel like for me anyway. I would, I would say that I, I guess I'm not necessarily expecting anything from anybody. I guess I'm aware that people are doing things for a reason, but it's usually not important to me. And if it is, then I just figure it out like internally by myself. I'm not going to like ask people why they're doing something. I'm just going to like know or assume why they're doing it. <laughs> mm. Um, but yeah, I don't 
I don't expect anything in return from other people, but sometimes I do get a little paranoid that if other people are doing something for me, that they're going to expect something back, which is why, like, I don't like when people, like, give me things or do things for me because it seems to create some kind of, like, abstract form of debt. That makes sense for sure. So I guess perhaps our, our next point of comparison and contrast is everyone's sensing functions and how that manifests. And maybe we can see some differences. What is everyone's experience with their sensing functions? With the INTJ and ISTP, it's the SE. And with the INTP and ISTJ, it's the SI. I mean, earlier we talked a little bit about the avoidance when it came to stress at a certain level, although I was much quicker to avoid than I was. But. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean by avoidance? Oh, back when we were talking about stress, and I was saying how I will often just try to avoid the stress and not think about it, then you kind of had that as a last resort. Well, I can't avoid, yeah, I can't avoid, it's a, it's stuff in front of me, you know, I can't, I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's my, it's my fourth function, right? So it's like, it's always, it's always on the radar. <laughs> I don't want it there, yeah. Yeah, typically the TJs try to prepare. I find that preparation does very little help for me. <laughs> yeah, same. Really? Yeah. yeah, if I, I, yeah, it just doesn't. I can't really overthink something. I just gotta half the time just wait for it to happen. Well, there's, Mark, I can how do you feel think about, about that? something for so long. <laughs> Even back when I was in college, I could only study for so long. It's like I would just hit this point where I was now done studying. So right now is as good as it was going to get. Even if I had another month to study, it just wasn't happening. Yeah, pretty much. Like all that thinking is going to end up being for nothing. So, so why bother? You're just stressing yourself out. <laughs> yeah, such a P approach. <laughs> How about you, Mark? What is your experience? Uh, what was the question, sorry? Yeah, so we were talking about how, you know, Mara and Spacey, planning doesn't really help. Sometimes it's it's better to just wing it. And Michael is like, no, I need the plans. So I was wondering where you land with that, Mark. Do you need a yeah, plan? Yeah, so, so very similar to like how Michael was sort of um, insisting on the questions that you were planning preparation structure is always appreciated. Yeah, for sure. So for me, um, generally things go better if there's a, if there's a plan in place, um, even if that plan does change over time or whatever, but it's just some idea, some sort of roadmap and how I'm going to go about doing something always helps. Um, particularly if I write it down, it makes a big difference. I think thinking about it is half as good as writing it down. If I physically write it down, that seems to help even more. So not sure why, but it just does. That's essential for me because it just it gets it out of my head. If there's if 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 it's if it's unstructured up here, then I'm free. I'm freaking out. You know, every I need to I need to get it out of out of here, um, out of my head. Yeah. Well, there you go. Extroverted thinking, but um, I, I, if we're talking about perceiving functions, I guess we're really comparing. Right, Mark and I to Michael and Mara, correct? Mm -hmm. So yeah. there has to be something, right, that Mark and I share with SI and NE. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to tease that apart. Yeah, I have a question. So with note taking, what is your stance, Mara and Spacey? Just curious. Do you take notes? Do you not take notes? Only out of complete necessity. I only yeah. take, well, in college, I did not take notes. Um, nowadays, so on, on the blog, we do character analysis. I have to take notes of the characters. Or I will completely forget everything and just walk away with my vague overall, they're this type. And that's not useful and not helpful. So when I absolutely have to, for my memory's sake, I will take notes, but I usually do not. Yeah, I relate to that, Mara. If I don't take notes, what will happen is I'll just have the conclusion statement. This person is this type. 
it really frustrates my like INFP friend out because it's like you have to tell me like why you got to that type <laughs> like why or you can how can you not explain or show your work yeah and and so fun factoid so at personality hacker when they do the live event and they have ti doms something they pointed out was that none of the ti doms at the event were taking notes and it's pretty funny because also in this panel the ti doms also don't take notes unless there's peer necessity and so I, I guess that's a small indicator of type just take it with a grain of salt but there is a slight trend I have yet to encounter a time where notes were a necessity. I have taken notes because other people claimed that it was a necessity and demanded that I take notes. And I never, I took the notes, but I didn't look at the notes ever. So I, I basically, I guess I just expect myself to remember all the salient details of everything. And, and I, I basically do. I mean, that sounds like SI to me because yeah, I don't remember that's the details. The SI so I problem. don't take the notes. I really do remember things that other people seem to be unable to remember without writing it down somewhere. Yeah, so that does transition us to SI. What does SI remember? <laughs> like at work, for example, I remembered that there was some parameter in, in the computer that controls one of the machines, right? And I remember exactly which parameter it was, and I remember it had to get changed from five gallons to 30 gallons in order to get the thing to work. But Obviously, you know, procedure is to like take a sticky note or something and write, you know, change parameter from five to 30 and stick it on the machine so that so that people know. And, I, and I, I'm like, I, I remember that if 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 you want to know what parameter was changed or what's going on, like I can tell you, I will remember it, you know, but uh, it seems like it's expected that it won't be remembered or that it needs to be recorded, you know. Maybe TE sees it as not foolproof. So let, let's say, sure, Spacey, you remember it. Oh, and it's not. But what if, yeah. yeah, something my TJ manager used to say was, how can we idiot proof this? So if you put the note with the number on it, then no one can mess it up. <laughs> oh, exactly. Interesting. I mean, I, I, I need the note in that case. I just got an air fryer. I just got an air fryer and everything that I make in that thing, I, I made a little database to put in like, what did I make? What temperature? How long did it take? And I take notes of the thing. And then I, when I go back, I can just open that, pop that thing open and like, okay, here's how it did. And then I give it a little like rating and be like, okay, do this different next time. And then eventually, you know, I have a nice little thing and I can just pop it open and make the thing. Otherwise I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna remember any of that. Mm. Is it also like a TE thing to create a database to create? Like, oh, I don't know, but I have so many databases. I mean, I have my type database open right now with all my, with all my notes on, you know, functions and stuff. Yeah. It's another way to create external structure. So it does meet the criteria for possible TE. So Mark, your thoughts on how your SI manifests. Um, just thinking about the note taking thing. Um, so I do take notes, but I don't really need to. I've got a good memory. I'll remember it, but um, partially what Spacey was saying, I do it because it makes other people feel better, that, you know, I'm attentive, I'm listening, um, you know, I'm doing my 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 share of being in that meeting. Um, but I think also probably a little bit of TE, like it just feels good to organise as well, just to write it down, and then to, like, cross them off as well. Um, so, yeah, I don't really need notes, but I do take them, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. So, Mark, I'm wondering, how would you differentiate your SI from like an INTJ? So like, how did you know not INTJ? What was like an SI thing that really rung true with you? Oh, just that post-processing of things. Like I can just remember conversations from years ago and things like that, just the memory side of it, like the rumination sort of side of things, post-processing interactions and events and things. Um, yeah, that was the big one for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I pre-process, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's the yeah. it's the complete opposite there, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the next differences and similarities we could draw from is the feeling functions. So with the INTJ and the ISTJ, they have tertiary FI, and for the ISTP and the INTP, they have inferior FE. 
So how would you be able to differentiate these feeling functions from each other? I would imagine people with FI, I guess at least in the, in the third slot, have, have some kind of personal attachment to things or take things personally on some level. Um, I know I don't pretty much. The only thing I can really have a personal attachment to is like a loved one, like a person. Uh, I have very strong likes and dislikes. I don't know about. Yeah, I don't. You did really? Yeah. No. Mara? Yeah, not not really. Mark? Pretty much straight away, I don't know if I like or dislike something. But <laughs> yeah, I might totally. not necessarily share that with people, but I know immediately whether I like it or not. Yeah, so that's one of the qualities of a FI. Not all FI users, like if they're an Enneagram type 9 FI user, it might get more complicated there. But in general, FI, sometimes you can point it out through its strong, distinct value preferences. And so like what Michael is saying, like the strong likes and dislikes. I was on a panel with Jamila, the ISFP, a few days ago, and she saw what I was drinking and it's sparkling water. Instantly, Jamila, the ISFP with FIS first slot, she was like, you know what? Sparkling water is an atrocity. I don't know why anyone drinks sparkling water. It just like is, I forgot the argument for it, but it was very impassioned and I was like, Oh, this is the FI rants. <laughs> it's like the strong like or dislike preferences off the bat quick. Yeah. It's millennials. We got, um, we realized that we were, we realized that the egg timer was ticking and we couldn't drink just our, just our sugary drinks all the time. So we had to pick up these things and make them, make them cool. You know, and make it like, oh, it's it, there's there's no difference between this and the other thing. It's trash. It's it's terrible. But it's like, I've gotten. I, I think I, I fall in between on this one. I mean, I drink it all the time. There's something about the carbonation that's very satisfying. But, um, but uh, that's yeah. Sorry, I didn't I didn't mean to get way late on the. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, so, yeah, yeah. I, I'm I forced to myself that. to enjoy it. <laughs> Definitely I'm strong opinions about stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm addicted to the mouth pleasure that comes from sparkling water. But yeah, it's it's funny when you meet like an FI user who has one strong opinion on one side. Like, I hate sparkling water. No one should ever drink sparkling water. It's a, it's an abomination. And then I know like another FI user on the complete opposite side. They're like, you know what? Sparkling water is great for intermittent fasting. You know, it's I love it. <laughs> and I'm like, man, if I get these two people in the same room, they're gonna kill each other. <laughs> Especially if it's like a religious stance. Man, that would get heated. <laughs> get heated and reclaimed. Sorry. That was... Yeah. For me to know whether I like something, I basically have to experience it. And sometimes I can even experience the same thing on two different occasions and, and find that I, my level of like or dislike for it is not the same, uh, you know, both times. So there's a whole shroud of context around whether or not I'm really going to like or enjoy it. And either way, it doesn't end up being that consequential. It's funny because I think of TI as being very binary and that's sort of what you describe, what it sounds like you're describing now, because I'm like, yeah, I'm too different. Like if I, if I listen to some piece of music twice, then I, I might have a different feeling about it, but I don't see that as like dissonance. You know what I mean? But it seems like, cause I, I, I think of the TI kind of binary, true, false kind of, kind of thing. Whereas like dislike is a total spectrum. Yeah. Definitely. And so it seems like the FI users are in tune with their likes and dislikes and can pretty quickly tell if they like or dislike something. And because of that, they can speak with a more definitive tone. Mm. Whereas with the FE inferiors, the INTP and the ISTP, they don't always know if they like or dislike something. And 
there's also a slight emotional delay there too. So that's a slight difference between the feeling functions there. And they're less definitive as well with the TI DOMs. So the last way I guess we could differentiate this is the NI types, so the ISTP and the INTJ versus the NE types, the INTP and the ISTJ. And maybe we can go over how that shows up for you all. Mark, how do you experience your NE? Yeah, NE is a real struggle for me, um, being that fourth slot. Um, for mine, a lot of the time it sort of pops up and it's too much choice, too many options, like too many, yeah, too many different ways to go about things. And it always comes back to that, you know, my stronger functions trying to limit that or find the best one of moving forward. A um, bit of that analysis paralysis, you know, too many different ways forward. Uh, but every now and then I'll get like, um, like little eureka moments from it as well. Just like little things that will sort of pop up or like little connections will be made. I go, oh, I wonder, like it just sort of comes from nowhere a little bit too. So it's probably, I don't know if I've explained it particularly well, but that's sort of how I sort of envision it anyway. No, that's pretty much it. I, I used to get the whole analysis paralysis thing a lot too, but I guess now now I, I, I learned pretty quickly to be like, ah, that's that's good enough. Like I know there's always more possibilities. Uh, you know, a lot of it is is feeling like uh, I'll never make the perfect decision. I'll never I'll never do just the right thing. Yeah, it's uh, just a big thing to start. Mm. Yeah, in retrospect, I'll always feel like I could have done better or I could have had a better idea. But yeah, it's definitely just it's just an idea generator, a possibility generator. That, that there's always uh, I, I use a lot of like qualifiers when I speak, you know, because I know what people might be thinking or yeah. how something might come off, and it, it's just constant bouncing back and forth and slowly narrowing. Yeah. So with extroverted intuition. I had a friend put it as it's both an idea scavenger and an idea factory. So it both produces a plethora of ideas and it also is hunting for ideas proactively. So I noticed with like NE users, sometimes they'll ask like a billion follow-up questions or a billion questions. It's kind of like trying to take in information sometimes. Like maybe it's less so for, you know, when it's NE's not first law, right? But I find that like sometimes NE users will try to, because they're bouncing ideas in real time, they sound kind of excitable, kind of frenetic. And it's almost like a nervous type of energy sometimes when they engage in NE. So it, it kind of feels like a quickness of momentum. I don't know how to explain it. It's more of a vibe aura thing because <laughs> uh, I'm an NFJ and I, I love referring to things. I'm, ki I'm kidding in terms of aura. And so I notice when Spacey is engaging in his NE, it actually seems a bit more like I have any friends who call their NE schizophrenic cokehead mode. So it's almost like <laughs> when they're engaging in it, they're like entertaining all the possibilities and the interconnectedness between things at a, like a rapid fire rate. And so you, you kind of notice it. It's, it's this ability to connect desperate ideas that are very different from each other. And it can also result in an INTP being more wordy too, because they are able to make all these connections. It's also SI related as well too. I hope uh, jumbled TI mess right now trying to explain it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when people are explaining things to me, they're like trying to teach me stuff, I guess I'll always be like, oh, so it's, it's kind of like X or it's kind of like Y. And I basically wait for them to be like, Nah, not really, or I kind of, or I'm really looking for them to go, yes, it's just like that. And then I can make that perfect comparison in my head and have like a complete understanding of it. Even though it's really not the same, I I'm just able to say it's like this in that way. Mm, yeah, this reminds me of, you know, NE right. likes to ask, it's NE does that a lot. And that's also how I explain things to other people. Mm hmm. I've seen people try to make TI about overthinking, but I, I, I tend to see that more from the NE users. Yes. They all play a strategy game with Ryan, ISGJ, and my brother, ENFP. They will take forever to make a single move. And I'm just over there like, 
I kind of take stock of what I have, make a decision. Okay, I'm done now. I'm not overthinking this. Like, this is what I'm going to do when it's my turn. And I'm just waiting and waiting to make it through their two turns, which will take forever. And I'm really wishing we had one of those little minute glasses or whatever those are. So they had a timer on them. <laughs> but it's like they have to weed through all of their options to figure out which is the best move to make here. Yeah, my friends used to hate me. <laughs> mm, the true kings of overthinking are the NE users. And then it's like, I'll miss something anyway and realize that I could have made a better move anyway after all that thinking. And that's exactly why I don't plan anymore. <laughs> Michael and Mara, how do you experience NI? What is NI to you? I mean, a lot of the time I just feel like I have to let a lot of stuff work itself out in the background and just have there's a kind of leap and leap of faith involved that I have to trust that, that things are gonna that the gears are turning. Um in the background, I take a lot of naps. I don't tend to like bounce ideas off of other people. Like any users have like a lot of facility. It's just like, just, just throwing the ball against the wall and everything. And in those situations, I tend to just sit back and just sort of take it all in and then just let it, you know, God willing, I have some time to let it just sort of, you know, sort itself out in the background and then I can sit down and sort of have a nice structured kind of order orderliness to, to things. And then I can do some planning and then I can execute. And a lot of the time people see the execution part of that and say, boy, how efficient. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, you know, I've been sleeping on this for three weeks or whatever, you know what I mean? So, um, but there is, there is, I feel like an element of just that, that, um, a, a kind of leap of faith where it's like, all right, well, I just need to trust that I can sit down and bang my head against the wall and try to figure something out now and not get anywhere, or I can sleep on it and it'll not, not it'll magically be there, but I'll have something to, to work with. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Michael brings up an interesting point. He says, people see my TE. And so that's another way you can differentiate these types. What you'll see first in people is their first extroverted function. So for the INTJ and ISTJ, that would be their TE. So for these types, you might actually see whiffs of it, whiffs of it from time to time, which is the case. Even from the way that you guys carry yourselves, there's, a, I don't know, there's a type of posture that TE kind of has sometimes. Whereas like for even ISTPs and INTPs, they're going to have more of an informal type of look generally. <laughs> like Mara has her hoodie on and she's kind of like chillish, you know, because you're going to see their first extroverted function in their stack. And for the ISTP, you're going to see their SE. And for the INTP, you're going to see their NE first. And so that's going to come across as a little bit of more chill demeanor, a little bit more casual. You know, Spacey has this cat running around in the background and Spacey's just like chilling out there. <laughs> kind of, I don't know how to explain it. Like you can even kind of tell sometimes when someone is, if they're a little bit more on the extremely informal side, it could be a slight indicator of SE or NE a little higher up sometimes. I don't know. I kind of see that here. No, I mean, I think you're right. Like, yeah, we have a more relaxed posture. I mean, people usually think I'm a lot younger than I am just because I have like this childlike demeanor or something, I guess. People still call me buddy, even though I'm like 30 years old. You know, it's just like, <laughs> you know, you know, the, the SI and the NI doms, yeah, they have like that rigid posture to them, a little bit more of yeah, a formal attitude. And I know, like, I'm like fuck, cat. <laughs> Let me see if I can find my webcam. But uh yeah, like I have this INTJ that I work with and even compared to me like he just sits there with like this resting bitch face just basically never saying anything totally still and compared to him I look totally like charismatic. 
with my with my fourth slot FE doing all the work it can, you know. That was so funny. Yeah. I'm in tears. <laughs> but yeah, there you have it. Wait, we didn't get to how NI manifests. Mara, Michael, and I. I just figured you were gonna skip me, and that was fine. But um, I can relate to uh, the kind of subconscious background processing. I feel like a lot of times I'm just just waiting for the answer to come, and not really actively thinking about it, which just kind of all ties into the avoidance thing. It doesn't; those two things don't help each other. Um, and all, and with NI for me, I feel like it's really because I have my TI mess, it's really hard for me to, to, when I'm trying to figure something out, to figure out the right question I need to ask to figure that out, which just also ties into waiting for the answer just to come to me because I can't actually find how to figure out how to find it myself. Another difference sometimes between NI and NE is NI has a hard time showing its work sometimes. So like Mara was talking about earlier, if she doesn't write down notes, she'll just say the conclusion, this person is this type. Someone will try to probe her for her reasons. It's really hard to articulate sometimes for some, some NI users. Which I'm really, really conscious of that problem too. So when people ask me and I go, I kind of throw out a hindsight disclaimer. Like, okay, I'm doing this on hindsight right now. It could be completely inaccurate, but this is my general impression. I have no data to support it. Unless I have notes to look at I go. But that also might be my SE preferring anyway, because I'm going to want a concrete data to support my conclusion anyway. So if I don't have that, I'm not going to trust my conclusion. Mm, makes sense. Whereas like with NE, they have a greater capacity sometimes to share their work because most of the work is con 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 conscious. In a sense, NE is traceable back to SI. So if you just explain the SI, you can somewhat explain how you made and there's a greater verbosity or ability to to explain your thoughts in NE just generally not always right but sometimes and that's a slight that's a slight indicator that you can sometimes catch on to and so NI is kind of like fishing you know Mara and Michael was talking about background processing so it's kind of like putting a fishing rod into the water and you're waiting for a fish to bite, but you're not like proactively searching. You're just waiting until that aha moment comes or that moment of clarity hits you and the fish bites. And that's when the idea strikes. So it's not like, I feel like NE sometimes has a guesser that is like, tries to guess prematurely, like what fish is going to bite the rod and they go like, oh, it could be that, or it could be that, or what if that? Whereas like NI is like, that's a lot of mental energy to waste on <laughs> generating possibilities. Whereas like, I feel like NI is kind of like a Zen pond or, you know, a Zen type of atmosphere to arrive at thought. Like the deeper NI users go into their NI, the more they tap into a calmer energy, if that makes sense. So I noticed like with NE, the more any users get into their NE, it actually is a speedier energy and almost feels more frantic. Whereas for NI users, the more that they're in their NI, it almost feels like they're becoming more calm or more settled like in a zen state or like a i don't know a, a pond that's settling <laughs> it's, it's more zen. i think it kind of depends i think it's like michael said and and i very much is just sleeping on it so to speak um that there isn't there isn't anything to do uh, i mean if, if you're someone like me i guess you you actually you do have to do something you have to do kind of some kind of conscious work to arrive at something. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be as holistic as whatever the NI user arrives at. It's, it's going to be, you know, close enough to whatever it is that you're looking for, mm. but it's never quite yeah. there. Um, mm -hmm. For me, I think the, the NE, it looks frenetic when it is being directly applied to my interactions with people. But I think most of the time, if I'm just like walking around on my own, it's actually just kind of like a hazy, floaty sort of feeling that I think if I am in, in a healthy mental state, it, it actually is pretty a pretty zen place to be in. 
Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's still in the moment. Yeah, so something that SE and NE share in common is that there's a present moment orientation to them. So SE is more present in the physical moment, whereas NE is more present with abstract ideas in the moment. So when any is engaging right then, it's like engaging right then, currently with that idea on the table. Whereas it's a little different with NI. It kind of feels like I'm in like a spaceship control room, I guess, where I'm seeing all of like the screens and holograms around me. But it's like that all the time when I'm walking around. <laughs> that, I guess that's what any sort of feels like. Wait, unpack that a little bit? What do you mean? <laughs> it, it's like it's like I'm in a room like full of screens and projections of like maybe what could happen over here in 10 seconds from now and what's going to happen there in a half an hour it's it's like these little like short-term projections around me sort of that i'm always kind of feeding on I, I, it's kind of hard to explain but i don't have yeah that. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and e is more voluminous with its guessing so it'll have a lot of short-term type of projections into into possibilities whereas ni is more scarce with its projections um it only has so so many <laughs> and, and it's either like it has a projection or it's blank <laughs> maybe so a little bit of i wonder blank. what that janitor's thinking about right now you know like a whole bunch of things thrown mm -hmm. in there but yeah yeah i will say like there are exceptions to the rule i see too like i could see an istj who's very like not connected to their NE. So they might relate more to an NI type of description. Oh, you're like kind of thinking about that singular thing, you know, cause SI has something that sounds really similar. Sometimes a lot of things can sound like different things. That, I guess that's the takeaway. So yeah, thank you everyone for, for coming out and representing your type. It was really great to hear about, ooh, cat. Yay, kitty. Thanks for that furry friend, Spacey. It was really interesting to learn about your relationship with your emotions, about how all of you can present very even keel, but maybe behind the scenes is a little different. You know, the INTJ and the ISTJ will keep their emotional cards close to their chest. You know, their emotional experience is a little more private. It's more intense. You know, you have really strong likes and dislikes. And it's just a matter of, you know, sometimes you just don't share it with people, but it's there. Whereas like, the ISTPs and the INTPs and their relationship with their emotions is, whew, uh, is a state of confusion, <laughs> a state of not knowing your emotions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really nice to hear all of this emo talk. I love this emo talk. <laughs> me too. Boy, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's nice. And you know, Michael talked earlier about how warm fuzzies make him uncomfortable. I, I live for the warm fuzzies, Michael. I am here to be your worst nightmare. <laughs> and yeah, that, it was really nice to hear about the feeling side of the thinkers and yeah, to get a deeper look with our binoculars and zoom in into the emotional perspectives of these types. It's also nice to hear the way you all logic out things, you know, with the TI DOMs, it kind of feels like a jumbled mess inside your head, but somehow that works. <laughs> and with the TE users, there's this desire to structure your environment and thus structure your thoughts or structure everything. <laughs> and so that's an interesting use in differing ways in which y'all approach logic and it's nice to hear your relationship with your crushes. <laughs> I feel like the viewers are now wondering what strategies they can use to kind of like, I don't know, confess to their crush who is within one of these types. <laughs> mm. It's really nice to hear into the emotional life <laughs> of, of types that don't tend to talk about their emotional life. And thanks, Mara, for your website, Practical Typing. It is both very practical and I like the tools you use for, for typing. <laughs> it's a really good resource for the 16 types and for the eight cognitive functions. ISTPs are known for their ability to sort out 
incongruencies or inaccuracies. And so that's perfect for a website that is explaining information. You know, if you want clean, clean sliced data on the 16 types, go check out Practical Typing. And yeah, they're cool in my books. And Spacey, <laughs> you're actually a kind of a kind of a chaos monkey <laughs> in the best way possible. <laughs> It's nice to, to see your technical difficulties, your cat issues. <laughs> it's interesting how when you're in the workplace, you're a completely different person. You're a TI DOM that's not in a stereotypical INTP profession. And I believe it's like, is it electrical, mechanical engineering? Something around there? It's factory maintenance right now. Factory maintenance. Yeah. So... It's interesting to hear about your factory maintenance life. And yeah, <laughs> you always have these like ground shattering metaphors you bring. Like today it was that, I think that rocket ship that you talked about and you, you're just able to give a wacky way of, of twisting an idea. You can tell in any connection when you hear in any connection. Just when Spacey was doing that rocket ship metaphor is very indicative of a high slot any user the ability to kind of make that that connection quick. So I don't know. <laughs> I feel like you're a really good example of an INTP spacey. <laughs> and yeah, you you represent your type with with honor and pride. <laughs> yeah. And Mark, you have like this stoic demeanor, but you have, you know, your FI emos inside. <laughs> and <laughs> it's it's interesting to hear your thoughts. You're able to summarize the TE points really well, and when you convey yourself, it's it's conveyed in a in a very eloquent manner. And your TE makes sure things get done, <laughs> so <laughs> we appreciate that. <laughs> it's it, it's quite interesting. Uh, it seems like the ITJs. Um, I I know generally all four of these types maybe might struggle with energy. At least I know the INTP, the INTJ, and the ISTJ do. I noticed that Michael drinks cups of coffee right before he films these sessions. And Mark does the same thing, actually. Uh, in our last it's one. Decaf. It's 10 o'clock p.m. right now. <laughs> so that's a interesting energy hack that you both use. <laughs> yeah. And it was nice getting to know you, Mark, both in our typing session and outside of it in these casual conversations as well, even though the time zone difference is a killer. And Michael, <laughs> you're like... We can... Yeah, yeah. Love you, Joyce. We're good. <laughs> no, you can't, you can't skip this. I get joy out of complimenting you. Is it like these four types who hate the compliments the most in general? I, I'm like, I wonder if that's the case. <laughs> Um, mm, it could be because I've had Mara go like, oh, compliments, cringe. And then Michael is like, uh, redirects, redirects conversation. <laughs> if words of affirmation was a reverse love language, like if it was a cringe love language, it would be Michael's first unfavored love language. Cringe language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just common everyday vernacular for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming on and yeah, this chat was fab. And so thank you everyone for watching. I'll see you all in the next episode. Bye everyone.